Hello, and welcome to our first British Art Network events. My name is Racha Patel, and I am an artist and a lecturer on the BA Painting course at Camberwell College of Art, UAL. The British Art Network promotes curatorial research, practice and theory in the field of British art. It is a network that compromises of curators, academics and artists, all of whom are actively engaged in caring for, developing and presenting British art in museums, galleries and other art spaces. Our network, British Asian Visual Art Post Cool Britannia, is supported by the Tate the Paul Mellon Centre and the Arts Council of England and UAL. I would specifically like to thank the Camberwell Public Programmes team for facilitating tonight's event and our tech support for this evening, Olivia Bright, who is studying at UAL. I will now hand over to my colleague, Daniel Sturgis. So how did this group come about? Last June, Rachel and I, with other colleagues from the painting department at Camberwell, were planning six anti-racist workshops which aim to use painting as a focus for the discussions in the art school around issues of race, post-colonial experience and migration histories. We wanted to think about how art holds meaning and how it was possible through art to have difficult conversations. So in planning this work, we were searching for a diversity of paintings or artworks that stem from painting in a broad sense. So we were looking for a diversity of work from artists from different diaspora communities from Britain. And we were really wanting to find artworks that captured, art, captured the artist's position and lived experience through a handmade engagement with materials. We realized with respect to the British South Asian community that finding that information was indeed, and indeed those artists was particularly hard. It was at that moment we decided we needed to do something. Raksha. A central theme to our research focuses on the lack of representation of British artists from diaspora communities in national art collections. As an educator who works in gallery collections, I, I rely on artworks for springboards for discussion. And some of these discussions include the histories of migration, intersectional identities, race and inequality. However, if the experiences of diaspora communities are missing off the gallery walls, then how can these conversations begin? And how can we evoke societal change via the, via the visual arts? The UK government census of 2011 states that people from Asian ethnic groups make up the second largest percentage of the population at 7.5%. This is followed by black ethnic groups at 3.3%, mixed and multiple ethnic groups at 2.2%. Collectively, this figure stands at approximately 18%, yet the artists from these diverse communities only represent 4% of the works in public art collections at best, and at worst, only a fraction of a percent. This data comes from a postdoctoral project called Black Artists and Modernism, which was, um, uh, which was made by UAL colleague, Dr. Anjali Dalal Clayton in 2019. There are artworks displayed by artists living in South Asia, um, displayed, in, displayed in the UK, um, and, and they tick box diversity in collections. However, we can argue that going down the global route often silences the voices of artists that live in the UK. We felt that the theme of the body, particularly the nude in Western European art, is not only gendered, but there are, they are also visual reminders of who is represented and how these central spaces are occupied. So when British South Asians are represented on mainstream platforms, they tend to revolve around a narrow set of narratives that represent British Asian life and, and often reinforce cliches. The three artists this evening challenge these representations, revealing the lesser known their works come from personal histories and lived experiences of both navigating the private, the public and political spaces. They question what we might know or what we think we know of British South Asian experiences. George Chakravarti is an artist who works with visual and live performance. 
using his body and image to explore the politics of identity. He employs religious and spiritual iconography references, referencing his multi-faith upbringing. His own physical presence throughout the works has been vital in creating dialogues about the body as a site, visibility, race and queer identities. Please be advised that George's presentation has nudity and sexually explicit language. I will now hand over to George. I'm going to start with some very early images that are made in photo booths. So this would have been around 1986, 87, and I would have been 16, 17 years old. I remember spending a lot of my time wanting to challenge the perceptions of what it was to be me, specifically first generation immigrant, queer, feminine, dark skinned and a South Indian. I did this by doing extreme things to my appearance so I appeared undefinable in some way. Thinking about it now, I think it was more of an act of rebellion and confrontation, a bit punk-like, anti-establishment and deeply political in its sometimes naive, fun, creative way. I would often take a bag of props and a few pound coins to the post office where this particular photo booth was and make these images. And there wasn't much time between the shots so everything had to be pre-planned. And these are just a few of many strips of images. It was like keeping a visual diary with no particular goal. I eventually got my own camera and this was a huge turning point because now I could make these images in the privacy of my own flat and with no time restriction. It also meant that even though I was still fueled by the same questions about identity and the body in relation to what was a very racist time in the 1980s, I was now able to make these more complex images in the safety of my own home. So by the time I got to art school in the mid-1990s, I was really quite established in my interest in visual language. What I needed and what art school gave me was an audience, critical dialogue and access to more equipment and space. This particular series of doubles comes from that time. I became interested in splitting the body or expressing the many facets of gender and identity, which may not always be visible. I also discovered moving image, which gave me another form to explore. It became apparent that there was very little documentation of Asian artists, especially queer artists who come from a very unique range of experiences and intersect many frameworks and substructures. These were things that I was starting to think about during this time, which is why I decided to keep my own presence at the centre of the work so that there's clear visibility of the subject and no uncertainty of authorship. Also to express some humanity and lived experience in the work within an area that's somewhat been hijacked by intellectuals and academics. And that hasn't changed since, and my presence continues to be central to the work. It also became very important for me to include my cultural heritage in my work, so that it isn't lost in the generic European debates about gender and sexuality. This piece is called Remote Control, which I regard as a seminal moment. It was made during a time when I decided only to focus on my body. 
This piece looks at the gendered body through a series of yoga asanas. Heritage and Biography brought me to make The Last Supper, and this was a first in a series looking at the performance and symbolism in paintings from art history, reconstructed to include biographical elements of my multi-faith upbringing, which has been a mixture of Catholicism, Hinduism and Buddhism. The subversion also raises interesting questions and creates new readings of the iconic painting. And this is a live performance piece and a life-size photograph. So I continued to place myself within these iconic paintings from art history with a piece called Shakti. And this is a hybrid of the goddess Kali and the Mona Lisa. It's an hour long piece and it's filmed in real time so it references meditation and also the very slow act of painting. There are six movements or phrases which occur every 10 minutes and it's shown projected the same scale as the Mona Lisa which is 77 by 53 centimetres.
I used to call these works paintings that never dry because they're always moving and never fixed. So in 2002 I was commissioned to make a piece called Barflies. Barflies is a triptych video installation with me as three different trans people in three different bars. Each one is specific in look and expression, so there's Maureen, a cross-dresser, Claire, who appears to be a transsexual trans woman, and Jasmine, a transvestite. So it's me as these three different personas sitting in three different straight pubs and clubs. The camera records my interactions with the people who encounter me or come into the frame. Technically, there's a small DV camera which is placed by the optics and it documents an hour of the action. The soundtrack is taken from live recordings on a telephone chat line where people are seeking to meet or engage with various trans people or alter egos. The soundtrack is mostly very sexual, but it also becomes very moving and confessional at times. There's so much more to say about this piece, and it's become more and more pertinent over time. You have a message from... Tony from Scotland. Hi, baby, this is Tony. I'm 24, I'm from Glasgow, I'm also 5 foot 8, very fair here. Uh, I've got a good body, uh, I'm very tanned, very toned. You have a message from... Good looking young guy. Yeah, good looking young active guy. Um, on life for fun. Get back to my number and you're up for a chat, yeah? Where about you calling from? You have a message from. Sleazy Tarty TV. Hi, it's Jane here with a Tarty Sleazy looking glamour mobile TV. I'll for absolutely anything special if I know that. To ignore it. You have a message from. David 38, bisexual West London. Well, I definitely love the sound of you. I love the sound of your sexy voice as well. Well, slow. You have a message from... Good looking young guy. You alright, this is Tom. Good looking young guy. Good from London. The mm -hmm. for fun. My number's 079. You have a message from... Uh, Sharon from Gloucester. I don't know, it's Sharon, Jasmine, the flip puss. You have a message from? Hi, it's Jane in Helmslow. Hi, Jasmine. Or as you say, sexy TV. Oh, I love the voice, darling. Um, well, hello. Right, OK, it's, uh, it's your agony aunt of the chat line here. It's Auntie Jane. Um, right, well, let me tell you a bit more about myself. I'm 48 years old. Uh, more mature tranny, darling. Figure to match, I hasten to add as well. Oh dear, things have gone south. You know it is, amongst us girls. But I'll be 49 next month. Um, I'm about 5 foot 7, 5 foot 8 inches tall. Uh, long black hair, all my own. Going grey with natural highlights. So no sniggery. Otherwise it's claws out and handbags at six paces. Um, I take about a size 18 to 20. I am slowly losing weight. Um, it was something I consciously decided on all oh, last summertime. I thought, God, I'm getting like a barrage balloon. I've lost three and a half stone so far without much trouble at all, so I'm doing well. Um, but uh, what else can I tell you? Yeah, blue eyes, great sense of humour. Um, can be the life and soul of the party when I really get going. Um, oh, in the downstairs knicker department, well, oh, well, you know. Um, it's six and a half inches, quite thick, uncut. Get no complaints there. Um, on the sex side, um, I like my sex slow and passive and gentle. Um, I don't like any rough stuff whatsoever. I get very upset if people do that to me. Um, that was due to a bad experience about ten years ago, but um, more on that later if we have a good girly goss. Um, I love, one of my main loves and one of the first things that got me into cross-dressing was I absolutely adore um, classic foundation wear and corsetry. Um, I've got loads of it. I must have, I must have about a thousand pounds worth by now. Uh, but I've, uh, so this collection that I have has been building up and still building over about the last seven or eight years. Um, some of my wardrobe got destroyed last year by my ex because uh, he was a bi guy. 
And uh, although he said he accepted me as being a tranny, he obviously didn't because he decided to rip my clothes apart one night with a bloody kitchen knife. So, you know, it's been a bit tough, but I'm sort of online here basically out to talk to trannies and uh, make new friends and uh, meet the girls and have a good laugh and sort of essentially just be friends. Um, you know, so like, um, if the perfect one's out there, then it's going to be a long-term one-to-one because I want a long-term relationship at the end of the day. Um, but also, oh dear, well, there's something else as well. Oh, I think I may have met my perfect man. Yeah, let us know, yeah. So once again, I return to reference painting with Olympia. A subversion of Manet's painting with me as Olympia, a brown, sexually ambiguous nude with a white male servant. This is also an hour long, but not in real time, as it's been slowed down. Again, it's projected the same scale as the original painting, which is 130 by 190 centimetres. This was a live piece called Miss United Kingdom, an archive. This was part of a bigger show produced by Ducky. The theme was Rural Britannia. I was particularly interested in the British beauty queens of colour who have perhaps not been celebrated as much as their counterparts, and I was particularly looking at the years when some of them had won, 1966, 1975 and 1994. This was essentially a nightclub posing piece with serious undertones, which the audience either engaged with or just enjoyed it for the glamour and the absurdity of beauty competitions. In 2011, I was invited by the Royal Shakespeare Company to create a project and I went back to Stills Photography. I chose to focus on the theme of death in Shakespeare, especially suicide, because it felt important to talk about the presence and longevity of suicide in Shakespeare's plays as an act of courage, passion and honour, and creating a dialogue about suicide as an act of terror in our modern world. There are 13 suicides across Shakespeare's plays, and apparently that's where the unlucky 13 comes from. It was also really interesting to occupy an English heritage space as a queer brown artist, and assume these roles from English literature.
and these are large-scale geotrans embedded in light boxes. So we get to more recent works, and this is the ambidextrous universe, an ongoing visual research which began after a very short but very intense illness. I had an unexplainable infection which left me paralysed over the course of six months. I spent all my time in bed and in pain, which brought an intense awareness in my consciousness and a state of acceptance and surrender. I've definitely not been the same since. When I recovered, I started making this work which looks at the body as a fragile, decaying and renewing structure. It also refers to the processes and seasons of botanical matter, alignment, symmetry, sacred geometry and other spiritual forms. So somewhat moving away from form identity and towards essence identity, unlike much of the work where the processes have been building on my body and working from the outside in, this work somewhat reverses that process and works from the inside out. I've continued making this work, looking at the mystical and esoteric traditions particularly related to the body, time and nature. I've become interested in rituals and yogas, ancestral memory and tribal art. I've also started painting, which is evolving alongside this photographic work, but these are some final images. Thank you, George. That was amazing. That was a, a very um, beautiful presentation and so great to hear more insights about your work. Um, I'm sure there will be questions that people have, but I think we'll gather the questions in the question function and come to them at the end. So uh, now I'd like to turn to the next artist who's going to be presenting, um, which is uh, uh, Jai Chu Chan. Uh, Jai is a painter who uses vivid colour in her expressionistic paintings that consider the female gaze in depictions of the body. Her paintings reflect an intertwining of transcultural aesthetic influences inspired by her position as an Indian-born British artist. Uh, over to you, Jai. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, paintings I'm going to show are oil on canvas, mostly seven by five feet to five by four feet. Um, some completed very recently and to be properly documented, so please forgive the repro quality here and there. Um, the title of this 2021 painting is The Protecting Veil, inspired by a musical composition by John Taverner, who was influenced by East and West. Um, there are two figures of the same sex, ambiguous, fighting or embracing. There are many precedents for such figures in art history, same sex or heterosexual, as in sculptures by Rodin and paintings by Indian artist Bhupan Kaka. Here the figures are in an arc within a room or landscape, as in how Indian ancient sculptural figures of female nature spirits known as yakshis are sometimes part of architectural portals. And as many of the buildings disintegrate, the figures may seem to hang in landscape that in my painting could be the edge of a planet or within a computer game. 
This is a detail about that painting. And for me, it's about emotions, the inevitability of sorrow and death within life, where the body and mind are protecting veils that may or may, may not protect. And in a 2016 painting titled Couple, there are figures of ambiguous gender and here viewed as if through a telescopic portal, um, organic bodies dissolving and forming on a bed of soft reds, all suspended in a kind of nightlike darkness. Um, I'm motivated by developing the painterly language in a combination of planning, chance and aesthetic lineages. I explore a female gaze in painting the human form, seemingly confined and isolated in room-like spaces. Um, painting for me is an arena for exploring psychological tensions in symbioses of male and female, home and unhome. This painting titled Figure in an Interior from 2017 has encrusted layers of paint offering a sumptuous sense of embodiment, appearance and perspection unfurling within the body. The body dictates what we are, as explored, for example, by Germaine Greer in her book titled The Obstacle Race, The Fortunes of Women Painters and Their Work. The body, the transcultural, the gendered gaze are my key concerns in making art today, together with developing the aesthetic language, challenging hierarchies in contexts of the other, where artists may be insiders and outsiders. The few representations of people of colour in Western art are loaded with hierarchies rooted in colonialism. Um, as an Indian born British woman of migrant roots, in painting images of the nude body, I'm working against the grain of stereotypes, somehow estranged. I embrace the challenge of combining aesthetic influences from the Western painting tradition with the dance configurations of classical Indian sculpture, in some ways overriding cultural differences in expressionistic paintings about the living body and the pl plurality of experiences. I'm inspired by the inner world of the Indian culture from which I originate and by living in the British transcultural nexus with an understanding of contemporary painting within and beyond the Western discourse. The body is presented as contested space, politicized territory for, subverse, sub, for subservience and dominance, resistance and independence, control or being out of control relative to the viewer and the viewed, rethinking voyeurism, Rosticism, race, and the gaze. The figures I paint often seem to be on a kind of plinth, with its association of hierarchies, of women as goddess or doormat, that is a misogynist denying of humanity. In two figures in a pink room here in 2016, the inner thoughts of the main figure are expressed in her facial expression, posture, and gestures precariously balanced in a fiery yet dark world. This figure, a woman and of color, has agency and is not passive. The interiority of mind and sensory, sensory body may appear almost visceral, a space of refuge and security or confinement and closure, uncertain and uncomfortable, obscured yet on show in a stage-like space. I work in series such as the grass series. In this 2011 version, a female figure reclines in a room-like space surrounded by vivid reds. Red is iconic for brides to wear in South Asian cultures, symbolizing fertility among other things. The figure is full frontal, provocative, challenging tropes of exploitation or celebration of sensuousness. Many ancient Indian sculptures and the art of Tantra concern dualities, 
polarities between male and female that continue to be problematic. Viewers have responded differently. One person initially thought it was a male figure. Another felt the image evoked a sense of abuse. When the first pandemic lockdown was announced, my first thought was women living with abusive men would be more trapped. So these thoughts are there. Women in South Asian arranged marriages are given away by families, almost always with love, creating conflict as to stay or leave such relationships in terms of family honor, etc. In Britain, women of South Asian roots have a roughly 30% higher suicide rate than the general population. But increasingly, marriages are not in arranged and relationships not formal, not always formal marriages, and often cross races and religions, though the female tends to remain conditioned to put her needs last. This figure could suggest desire and erotic power, though despite a plethora of images of women as sexual objects and showing themselves so, sometimes with enjoyment, it remains problematic for women to express sexuality as subjects and instigators, explored by very many people, such as the writers Simone de Beauvoir, Audre Lorde and Arundhati Roy. The in 2012 shows the figure upside down, suggesting disorientation, but also artistry and effort. In the catalogue for my 2013 solo show at Victoria Gallery and Museum in Liverpool, art historian Rena Aria has considered how it is this area concentrated around the stomach and genitals and framed by the bent legs that becomes the focal point of the paintings. Ordinarily, the head is conceived of as the intellectual seat of reason, but here the head is no more than an extension of bodily sentience. Here, the latest version is in progress. The large scale of paintings creates a frisson, visceral and provocative, a jolt to the eyes through intense color and physicality of paint with limbs and facial features often disfigured in focus or blurrily glimpsed. In memories we don't remember, the figures seem vulnerable with memories remembered or repressed. The reds envelop the forms, creating for me a sense of desire, longing, haunting and regret. There is delight in the body, how it feels decked out, but also potential for anguish, sadness, separation, loss, and death. A sense of networks of power is implicit in poses, gestures, and facial expressions of figures operating as protagonists or recipients within social mores, including of South Asian cultures, being deeply patriarchal, including in Britain, and where arguably expressions of sexuality by women have a greater sense of transgression. In this 2016 painting titled Refugee Girls, the figures may be refugees from war or a culture that is home and unhome. In the background, four figures appear in a portal that could be a memory, a mirror or TV screen. In a forthcoming book titled Refuge, distributed by Corner House Publications, Based on my two solo shows for Asia Triennial Manchester 2018, Graham Gillock has written about this image. To paraphrase him, their skin colour and flowing clothes suggest South Asian or African descent. The facial expressions form a triptych of emotions and hesitancy, caught unawares, glancing at the onlooker. An image of the figure of the refugee, of the transitory and fleetingly arrested, displaced and itinerant, representative of the modern in notions of the fugitive as an aesthetic imperative of modernity, as famously formulated by the poet Charles Baudelaire in his 1863 essay, The Painter of Modern Life. 
I've seen more or less at any time, including portraying people I know, as in couple in studio, that was in my 2002 solo show at the Lowry, alongside a solo show of work by Indian artist Bhupan Kaka. Curators have located me as a British South Asian, a woman and a painter. As when I showed my paintings in the UNESCO sponsored exhibition, The South of the World in Italy in 1991, with artists selected to represent their country of birth. So I represented India. Whereas in the Art Ankara Contemporary Art Fair in 2020, my paintings were in a show representing Britain. As in this painting title, Seated Figure, multicultural is reflected in the people I paint. It is the British environment. In 2007, Liverpool based poet Levi Tafari, who I have worked with, posed for me in his traditional clothes from Ghana. In the late 1990s, with Al Nomitha and Kim L. Pace, I co-curated the Lines of Desire touring show of work, including our own, and by artists from locations such as Ireland, Pakistan, and Britain, with work by artists such as Paul Arago, focusing on the transcultural in making drawings. Currently, I'm preparing for a show at Art Centric Space in Delhi, India, of work by five, five artists from India, five from Sri Lanka, and five British South Asian women artists from Britain. Um, myself, Saima Rashid, Paminda Kaur, Jasmia Creed, and Halima Cassell, curated by Alno Mitha, the director of Asia Triennial Manchester, collaboration with Monica Jane, the gallery director. This is a scan from a Tate catalogue of Slow Dance Morning, 1988. Here I reflect ecological concerns, ideas of micro and macro, natural life cycles in Indian art, and the movement in, in Indian musical ragas. This kind of work was shown in group shows internationally and in the UK at venues such as Tate Liverpool in 1990 of works by artists from the north of Britain, such as Fila Megan. And I showed work again at Tate Liverpool in 2013 to celebrate 25 years of its existence alongside artists such as Yoko Ono. Also in places such as Barbican London, alongside work by artists such as Gillian, Gillian Ayres and Rashid Areen, and in solo shows as at Blue Coat, Icon and Horizon Gallery in London, and at Horizon Gallery again, alongside artists including Chilla Berman, in a brave riposte to there being no British South Asian women artists in the famous 1989 The Story Exhibition at Haywood Gallery of British, African, Caribbean and Asian artists. And here there's a painting titled Morning, and it's a part of, a part of this strand of work, which is ongoing. The curator Amrita Dalu, who visited my studio, found my use of colour, reminded her of visiting Rajasthan, where I remember feeling at home. The painting here titled Gallery from 2021 is based on my visiting the 2018 All Too Human exhibition at Tate Britain, where I felt at home among the works, such as by Giacometti, Freud, Bacon, Kossoff and Clark. The last section showcased paintings by women such as Paula Rago, Jenny Saville, Cecily Brown, Celia Paul, and by Lynette Yadombokai, and so underlined the contemporary transcultural. Um, Self-portraiture is an engagement with myself as both subject and artist. Here are some very recent paintings in progress or maybe finished and really weirdly photographed on my phone this morning, awaiting proper photography. Um, and here, in a sari um, that I very rarely wear, so strange for me to be seen, um, a costume that is seen as the other in the British mainstream. 
and in my usual clothes in a strange looking space. The Art Council England collection has a self portrait that has been shown, including at University of East London, alongside work by artists, including Sonia Boyce. And that particular painting led to my body series, series exploring the maternal nude and childbirth with some of the work in a solo show and the collection at New Hall at the University of Cambridge that focuses on women artists, but unfortunately no time to show work from that series here. Um, room, room 1, 2020, has figures juxtaposed with fractured spaces and forms, suggesting conflicts between personal and social roles, reveal things the eye alone cannot see, evenly scanning fields of vision, differently from when painting, abstracting and editing, aligned with how the human eye perceives, with focus shifts, blurred, peripheral or concentrated looking, influenced by physiology and experiences. For me, visualization in the mind is vague. Visu the visualization properly occurs in making the image with paint and colors that could not have been imagined and does not exist in the world outside itself. Colors, pigments bound, bound in oil, offer me a magical unfolding of images in paintings that have their own life, often demolished and remade towards a precarious resolution. Painting for me has the mystery of its appearance embedded within the materiality of the making of an image. 2021 uh, was triggered by internet images of a Nigerian woman being attacked by Indian men in India and by paintings I've seen of the death of Cleopatra that somehow got mixed up in my mind by looking at people going through a revolving door and thoughts of the perpetual cycle of the kind of autopilot awareness of danger for women in many, in many spaces. I find painting is time-based. It requires viewing over time, over minutes, hours, years, the digital is a wonderful resource, but people queue up to see physical paintings, even those easily seen on the net, as it, as it is entirely different. And here another detail from the same painting. Um, Shadows on the sea, sorry, and um, yeah. Shadows on the sea started from seeing news footage of migrants on the Mediterranean and evolved to be more about the male forms in themselves, with a sense of turbulence and ambiguous movements and shifting focus, shadowy, merging or defined in watery currents of rippling light. I apply paint with smudged caresses and scumbles or firm lines and violent gestures in filmy or thick layers it is a strong physical and emotional collect connection, like a powerful embrace, a physical and psychic charge, so I become the mark or colour. Images arrive from a mixture of delusion, spontaneity and chance, the haptic application of paint and colour, an embodiment of the self. It is about empathy for the human, with the human touch, made with paint. The image changes, is revised, destroyed, remade, drastically or almost imperceptibly, tangentially, precariously where a mark can change everything at speed or slowly over months, as though the image painted itself while I just happened to be there. My remodel painting studio solo exhibition for Asia Triennial Manchester 2018, I remodeled the gallery at home into a staged studio, commencing large paintings alongside completed paintings in an installation with film, music, um, objects, stories, and events with dancers and life models, with space for visitors to also paint. Asia Triennial Manchester, 
is a key major project in Europe, showing work by artists from Britain and from Asia and its international diaspora in an impressive series of exhibitions, conferences, publications and community engagement. Founded and directed by al Mitha, Asia with its complex vastness and non-homogenous variety is embedded in Britain and the diasporic experience uniquely develops aesthetic hybridizations. My ATM 18 other solo exhibition called Title Refuge, uh, which was at Gallery Oldham, I staged a traditional exhibition of about um, 12 paintings. British South Asian is a label that often stereotypes. Many heritages are mixed with that as a strand among others. I use the term with this complexity in mind. British South Asian artists in Britain should have the freedom other artists enjoy. Tracy Emin is not dismissed for her work, not focusing on race or ethnicity. Um, things such as the Turner Prize, um, the John Moore's Painting Prize, um, the still influential y YBAs, this is, this is, these are the spaces where that exemplify British, British art. And yet, um, to, to be very crude, and I use the term very, um, a term I don't like, these, st these spaces remain mainly white, with exceptions to the rule. Um, people such as um, Lubaina Himid, um, Chris Afili, um, Anish Kapoor. British South Asian art is um, diverse. It's um, very much um, alive and it's underrepresented. Um, so on that note, I'll just say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jai. So many thoughts are going in my head uh, uh, for what you were saying, um, you know, about being a British painter. And, and one of the things that's so striking about your work is that um, I can see that these figures are in Britain, but you don't have the landscape of Britain, uh, buildings, um, architecture, you know, gardens, whatever that kind of tell you that this isn't this is Britain. But I, I can see it through the light, or or you know, whatever. And you're so right. We we you know these spaces. Um, you mentioned the John John Moore Tanner Prize and all the all these various um, different shows, but in particularly painting, uh, painting is such still such a white dominated male space and and uh, you know uh, it's high time it changed so, but we can talk about this another time there's so much to say and i just wanted to uh, thank you so much for your for the presentation of your wonderful work um it's now time to introduce alia said um, Alia is an experimental filmmaker whose work has been shown extensively in cinemas and galleries around the world she is interested in storytelling, time and memory, and the juncture of personal realities, which she explores through different subjects' positions in, in relation to culture, diaspora, and location. I now hand over to Alia. Thank you, Rutra. Thank you, um, Jai, and thank you, um, George, for the wonderful presentations. Um, and thank you, Daniel and Rutra, for organising this event. Um, I'm not going to do a, I'm just going to choose a couple of films that I'm going to talk about, which are not necessarily in any order, but just ones that I think are pertinent for this talk. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit and then I'll show the first um, clip, which is going to be a one minute clip of Fatima's letter. And hopefully there won't be any technical hitches. <laughs> So um, I made Fatima's letter at the Slade in 1991. And at the same time, I was responsible for running 16 millimeter black and white print and processing service at the LFMC, building on techniques I'd learned whilst a student at University of East London. 
Working exclusively in 16 millimeter film, I, exper I experienced the materiality of the medium firsthand. The chemical process underscored how form and content develop in tandem, often shifting in relation to one another. I came to London from Glasgow in 1981 and I was 17. Major social shifts took place between 1981 and 1991. The Thatcher years, a civil war, summers of protest against increasingly confrontational police powers and huge unemployment. Hansworth Songs was commissioned by Channel 4 in 1986. Pratiba Parma made Sari Red in 1988. Third Text came into existence in 1987 and Salman Rushdie wrote Satanic Verses. Then there was the Fatwa in 1989. Fatima's letter grew out of all of this. I wanted to find a way that spoke to ideas of cultural difference, of the racialized female body, of perceived Muslim otherness. But, but I did not want to take the but I did not want to place the viewer in a binary oppositional mode of viewing. So I chose a female voiceover, which centers the film in Urdu. Lapsed translations in, in English, followed by lapsed translations into English. The, new, the viewer negotiates different registers of language. So I'm now going to show um, a one minute clip from اس قدر تیز تھی کہ کھانے سے پہلے ہی سر چکرا جائے اور وہ وہاں بیٹھے تھے مست ہلکی سی گرمی اور پنکھوں کی بھر بھراہٹ میں چمبیلی کی خوشبو اور نونے حالوں کی پکڑم پکڑائی کے کھیلنے کی آوازوں میں اور بڑے بچوں کی کیرم کھیلنے کی ٹک 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 میں جو اپنے کھیل میں for me, film is a process of revealing and of redaction. This is perhaps most evident in Priya, a 16 millimeter film I made after my first experience of digital editing, whilst completing an AHRC research fellowship looking at how narrative and the notion of the edit translate through various viewing contexts and mediums. I was really aware that I, I couldn't touch the film, I couldn't feel the film, everything was very removed. Um, this prompted a shift in my relationship to 16mm and answered the riddle of a scene consisting of an aerial shot of a Kathak dancer twirling on the spot. Um, so Kathak is a syncretic form of classical Indian dance, um, um, mainly prevalent in the north of India. Um, the image fell into too many stereotypes. I wanted to extend the moment of encounter to, problema to problematize the traditional position of spectator to skin to screen. I buried the film in soil and vegetable matter to distress the surface, rupturing the consumption of exoticism manifest within the image of a woman in a white shilwa kameez, Eastern garb. Creating a dialogue between the performance of the dancer and the dissolution of the surface of the celluloid, the image of the dancer falls away. We witness her reduction whilst the chemical structure of the filmic surface is revealed. Edited as a continuous loop, a tension between abstraction and representation arises. We become interpolated in a perpetual cycle of creation and destruction.
Whilst writing is an important aspect of my practice, so are notions of documentary. Each discipline is used in opposition. In points of departure, empty views of Glasgow are placed within a soundscape that at first glance bears no relation to what we see. The viewer becomes engaged in questioning how different registers of language take precedence. Our desire to comprehend, to have, to have power, is brought into alignment with our attempts to decipher. Thwarting the traditional position of the spectator. However, points of departure and Fatima's letter are also the product of my immersion in and reaction to particular locations, either geographical, historical, and, and often both. How that immersion is recreated within the immersive space of cinema is an important aspect of my work. I strive to a towards a poetic that embraces the viewer. So we're just going to play a one minute clip of points of departure. I have none of the right words. The tablecloth has alternate lines of blue, green, blue, then purple. By the time the yellow square reaches the border, it is either green or orange. The pink square is always purple, the blue square green. It doesn't add up. Whichever way you go, it comes out different, but the border is the same in both directions. I am trying to comprehend why I find comfort in this object, trying to locate a memory. The only logic seems to be that I had no hesitation in keeping it. I am continually falling. I think of the squares. The fall slows down. Propelled horizontally, I am retracing my route to school. The dates don't fit. The year I was born. My first year at school. Decimalization. The next film that I'm going to show um, is going to be Clippy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that first. So both Clippy and Points of Departure were a result of doing a residency working with the BBC archive in Glasgow. I found newsreel footage of a funeral cortege walking down Dumbarton Road. The march was led by two men of colour. I was fascinated not only by the shot, but also how it had been archived what information was left in and what had been left out. My quest to fill in the gaps led me to interview Asian elders who had worked for Glasgow Bus Corporation. Of course, no one remembered the actual event, but the image triggered other memories. I was a bus conductor for nine months. So we had a good training of the buses. My uncle came 1936 or 34. That's an like old uniform, really. There, I had the badges there like this. 1969. All right, okay. I'm a Godwell's boy. 46 Bath Street. That was the head office of the Glasgow Corporation. And I walk all the way in the morning from Gorbals to Ibrox. Really, I walk three and a half miles in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. There's a lot of snow there, and I march. Sonny, how are you so early? I said, why not early? I just walk. Well, he said, there's a bus goes for a staff bus to pick you up. But you have to tell them beforehand. I said, I didn't know. Somebody can pick up that quickly and the staff bus. So he told me, and he showed me the driver, and I told the driver where to be pick me up. And next day I was in a staff bus. Because that was the best job, clean uniform, they always very clean. Nice and clean shoes, tie in collar, and the, the, of the uniform, always every second, third day press coming. Because my boss thinks that I'm a very punctual, as punctual as clock. So he promoted me in nine months and he made me a bus driver.
if, if I know the names, I may know them. I don't remember. Scholland or from Partick, oh, Ray UK. And because we had a very, very friendly atmosphere in the bus with the, with the passenger. Because I work in two, two bus garages, the Ibrox and Govan garages. And we were very, very happy. I just want to say a few more words just about why I call myself an experimental filmmaker and what my process involves in relation to the material. Um, a film records its own make, a film's record of its own making involves a meditation on the con contradictions that emerge from the activity. The process involves doubling. Representations echo materially within the fabric where sound and image flex revealing limits that rebound within the space of viewing. Between us and the film a reciprocation. The subject questions, moves along vectors of space created by the film's structure. I believe that a dialogue happens through the intention of an idea, how it comes to exist in the world as a thing. For me, politics also starts with listening to your material acknowledging how the act of making transforms your immediate world. Conversations ensue, matter dialogues because of you, but somehow without you. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Alia, that was, that was wonderful. Um, just a small sort of um, insight into, into your films, uh, uh, obviously, but it's, uh, very sort of evocative mix, mixing of history and uh, materiality and, and and memory all coming together. Um, so th thanks to all the all the artists who've presented, and we now have some time for some questions. We've been collecting them in the chat as we go, and please do keep adding to them. Um, and we we're running a little bit late, and I, um, we'll uh, because of that we'll probably just have two or three questions for each of the artists. Um, but I'll pass to Raksha now, who um, uh, has been uh, gathering the questions as well, um, to ask the questions which you've been posting. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your wonderful presentations. And um, yeah, there's some really interesting questions in, in the chat. And um, uh, I'd like to ask the first question to George. Um, it comes from Mita Solanke, and she asks, um, I'm interested in how you view the significant change in your work, the ambidextrous universe from earlier works. It's curious that a physical illness has extracted a spiritual expression in your work, whereas in earlier work, it feels like you were exploring um, inferiority identity um, and that prompted uh, very physical works. Can you comment on this dictomy, please? Well, that's, a, that's a, big, a big question. It requires a really long answer. Um, um, yeah, um, it's actually something I haven't, this is the first time I'll be talking about it. In fact, I don't think you even know about this structure. So this might be news to you, but I became really Ill, Ill in 2012 and it wasn't until 2015 that I actually just kind of gave in to um, the change that I was experiencing. So I started saying no to a lot of the work that I was getting from people knowing my work to be what it was. And it felt, it, and even though I, I obliged and made that work, it never felt the same. It felt like I had to something had been lost felt so it's it's very very hard to articulate um in in spoken language i could only articulate it in visual language um so i started making that work in 2015 and it's still kind of evolving so i i really i really don't know where it's leading me and and i think to talk about it or 
to try and in a way understand it which, which might actually put a stop to that process so I'm letting it just take me to wherever it's taking me thank you George it, it is news to me I didn't I didn't know about your illness I I'm really sorry to hear that but it's really fascinating to you know to kind of talk about the split the switch between um how how you present yourself um externally and then kind of the, the inner kind of exploration and kind of the insights to the inner exploration and and to kind of put that in that inner exploration um in into visual form is is quite something else you know it is yeah i, I think i've spent i've spent so many years working externally i mean i say that in my in my talk that working from the out, you know the the outside the surface of 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 who i am um, and then that shifting and working from the inside out. And I don't really like using the word spirituality because again, that's another word that's been hijacked um, and it's just become a, a word. It doesn't mean anything, um, but it is, a, it is a, I mean, the only way I can describe it is like waking up from a dream and not knowing, not knowing quite what's real anymore. Is this, is this, it's, I felt like I'd lost something. Um, Mm. Or, or or gain something I don't know, but it, uh, it's been a, it's been a strange five years to um, to 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 apply that um, personal uh, evolution into visual visual work. So it's been quite a challenge actually to 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 bring that into some kind of um, communication. Um, Thank you so much. I mean, with this, just so much we can kind of go on to talk about and uh, unpack here in, in terms of uh, looking at how spirituality has been depicted um, in the East, like mandalas and Tantra and all of that. Mm -hmm. But we, we will have to save that conversation for another time. Yeah. Um, we have a question for Jai. It's from Hannah, um, who says that she loves your loved your presentation. Thank you. And she asks, uh, for your project in Manchester, you remodeled the gallery space to extend your work beyond the canvas. You also spoke about how white these white cube institutions are. Um, should we give up on galleries? And are they, in your opinion, are there ever gonna be appropriate spaces for South Asian art? Thank you very much for that wonderful question, um, question. And yes, I really enjoyed the project at um, home, the art centre called Home in Manchester, because I think painting is performative in its making, and it's also performative in its viewing and its reception. So it was wonderful to create a synergy between the performative in painting and the performative in dance and music, and even, you know, life models and so on. So that was really wonderful. Um, I don't think we should give up on galleries and institutions. Uh, we need galleries, we need more galleries. Um, galleries are as vital to me as living and breathing almost as music. Um, I often think I would die without music if I couldn't, didn't have music. I think I would die, metaphorically speaking, if I didn't have art to look at. People even in concentration camps um, made art on scraps of paper, so art is important. And, and I have went to see the Rodin show at the British Museum, for example. I took the train specially three times and paid the money to go and see the work in it, itself. So I think we need, and I don't see why South British South Asian artists shouldn't have the exact same access to galleries and museums and access to displaying their work in galleries and museums as anybody else. So I think we need to engage more with these institutions. By, by we, I mean British South, Asia, British South Asians, but really, I don't like these we, us and them kind of terms at all. So I'll, re, I'll rephrase that. British South Asian artists need to engage more with the institutions and we need to try and make the institutions engage more with British South Asian art. And I'm quite depressed a lot of the time. At the moment, I think there's nobody in any really important position in any really important um, institution 
um, who really seems to care about British South Asian art. They will show art from South Asia itself because it's more exotic perhaps, but British South Asian art is incredibly distinctive because we work, we produce art within systemic racism for a start. And in any case, our experience is utterly dis different. Britain isn't the same as living in South Asia. It's a completely different environment and the art reflects it. And we need to be represented in exactly the same way. And not just identity politics, but the full spectrum of human experience. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for saying that, Jai. And, and one thing that uh, stood out to me from what you were saying, it, it's often seen, oh, the artist should the artist should engage more with the institutions, the artists should put themselves out there for curators. But but it needs to be the other way around as well. It's a two way dynamic. The the institutions that are not showing our work, the the, the fraction of a percent that came from Angeli Dalal Clayton's uh, research it needs to be increased. It, it, it's, it's not reflective of um, the diversity of this country. It, and, and there's so much work out there. So it's, 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 I will put it out here while we're here that, that the institutions need to engage with us um, and see what we're doing and, and um, acknowledge the fact that we are British and um, our lives are, are very different from those that live in South Asia. You know, many, many of us may never have ever been to South Asia in our lifetime. You know, our, our experiences are, are living in this country and they're British and, and that's reflected in, in our work. It's reflected in your work through the figures and the color and the way that you, you, you apply oil paint. And again, you know, we could have another whole seminar just on this one topic, but I would really like to share a question uh, that's put forward uh, by Bessie. Uh, for Alia, and she asks, um, um, well, she's asked a few things. She's asked, much of your film work um, in, you have is available on your website, which I found very unusual for a film artist. How do you balance making your work accessible to the public and protecting it from online theft? And then there's another part to this question where she asks, um, um, Alia, I love the way that you use sound and voice in your film. How do you see the role of your voice in your work and what do you hope to achieve through it? And how does it usually turn out for you? Um, well, I work with sound a lot. Um, I actually spend more time working on the soundtrack than I do on the visual, on the visuals. And I am um, very conscious of the relationship between the two and how sound shifts your perception of an image or how an image will shift the perception of the sound. So, I mean, I do think about sound and image as um, um, junctures where new meanings can arise from the, the, the placement of those two things together. Um, so what do I want to achieve through it? I mean, what I want to achieve through it is that the, the, the space that you are in ceases to be um, linear ceases to be literal, ceases to be um, representational. I mean, I, I, although film is a representational medium, I think that that is one of its least interesting aspects. So for me, I, what I'm interested in is how these different sorts of languages, the, the image, the sound, ha have different power structures within them and how then you can then become aware of how you absorb media and how you place yourself in and through the medium that you're watching. So what is your, how do you um, identify as a spectator? How do you, or how do you not identify? Or how do you negotiate? And how do you become aware of your own positionality within the text that you're viewing? The text being that of the film. Um, the civil war that I'm uh, uh, I'm referring to is the civil the British is is Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was prime minister for almost ten years, and she famously said that there was no society, and she basically um, took away so many union rights, re re restructured the whole face of British modern society. So 
bit or so there was a lot of um, resistance to this. There was the miners' strike. There were the protests in Toxted, in, in Brixton, in Birmingham. Um, there was increased pr police pr police brutality towards um, Afro Caribbean and uh, black young black men. So all of these things is, is to do with the um, the civil war that I'm talking about. And, and it's really interesting that that you know you you, you know you you call um, you do, you call it a war and it's something that I've not thought about. But for for many of us, um, uh, you know, the seventies and the eighties uh, for our parents and and for us as I was a um, school child at the time, it was a very violent time. And yeah. I think um, you know um, uh, you know many of us will carry trauma from that time. Um, but, but, you know, it's important to, to kind of note here that um, the work that emerged from that time, um, um, you know, it's very different from the work that is made today because it's, re it's kind of not, I won't call it reaction, but it, it, it did, um, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a reaction to the politics and the life at the time and people um, wanted to kind of uh, challenge all of that racism um that that kind of spread and and took power at that time through their work you know yeah um and and it it, it kind of leads into I, I don't have time for one last question it's a question for any of you um and it's one of the first questions that came in from um nim who uh, would like to ask e each of the artists what belonging means to them and how their art transmutes this notion so what does belonging mean to mean, mean to you all and how, how does art transmute this notion so i don't know if, if any of any of you feel like um answering uh, nim's question i think as, as, as sorry, sorry. So, oh sorry as an artist um i think i feel like i belong to the world of art and the world of art is universal. It's to do with being a human being. So, um, and, and people who try to create differences between people are usually doing it for their own political um, motives, or it's usually through um, ignorance. Um, and then when people become familiar, as you know, as when migrants first come into this country, um, they're seen as the other, they're different. And but bit by bit, there's an, a process of acculturation goes on, which is what's happening now with the with many British South Asian communities. You know, as Raksha said a little while ago, a lot of Brit British South Asian people in inverted commas have never been to India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, you know. Um, so things change over time. Sorry, anyway, over to you, George. No, it, it kind of, you, you, I was going to say something similar, but I was yeah. just going to say how, how that feeling of belonging, uh, for me anyway, has changed. Uh, I came to England when I was 10 and I was desperate to belong. And by the time I was 15, I just didn't want to belong. Um, and, you know, five years ago, uh, something incredible happened. Um, and it feels like th that the question of belonging has completely has a completely different meaning for me. Um, and it means, well, belonging is, is this is just a personal thing. Um, this sort of outward looking for some kind of some kind of wanting to be embraced somehow by by institutions, you know, culture, people, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And you kind of lose a sense of who you are when you're when you're out looking outward so much. Um, so belonging is is something that I think for me has really changed. Um, and I'm quite happy to, you know, it's a bit like you know, the, the, the isolation that's happened during this awful COVID time has been really, really painful for a lot of people. But for me, I've, I've really, it couldn't have happened at a better time for me. I've really enjoyed being isolated. So for me, it's like the meaning is always um, 
changing and evolving. And I might not feel like this next week, next month, five years time, but at the moment it just feels like I don't really care. I, I'm kind of really happy belonging to myself and, um, and, and, and still being able to make connections with people um, like you, like Raksha, like connecting with an audience tonight. Um, that's really important, but the belonging thing is, 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 a, is a very complicated thing for, for me at the moment. As you can tell, I, I can't quite say it in one sentence without talking about so many different things. A bit like my work. Um, yeah, I, think, I, I, I mean, for me, belonging is a bit over, over, over egged. I mean, I don't know what, what it means or what does one achieve from belonging to somewhere or something? I mean, does that mean that you're happy with that society? Do you find yourself there? Are you affiliated with the cultural values? No, I'm not. I'm not affiliated with what's going on or find um, peace with, with the current moment. And I've always found, um, you know, because I am a political being. Um, so, and even if I did belong, that, is that enough? I mean, how do we want to affect the societies that we live in? Um, so I, I, I don't, I think it's quite a, con uh, um, but at the same time, we reform networks with our friends, with our colleagues, with our comrades. Um, so it's also a question that's always posed to, to, you know, black and brown people. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, we should really ask the other people uh, the same question. Yeah. And maybe we can we can we can meet at some sort of middle ground where we really um, agree on a, a one aspect of what it is to belong, because it's the question I'm. I, I feel like I've been asked so many times um, by so many different people, and I feel like I should have a, a different answer for each each group of people who ask me that question. But tonight, I, I feel really comfortable to say, I really, I, I think it is over-egged. I think, you know, this, this idea of belonging is, it somehow puts you in a place of want. Um, and I don't want to be in that, in that place of want. I'm, I'm, I belong, I belong yeah. wherever I am in the moment. And I belong to this right now, and I'll belong to something else in an hour's time. I think philosophically, we, we can come to terms with all these things and have our own sphere that we feel comfortable in. And I mean, the last Asia Triennial Manchester, the theme was, who do you think you are? You know, a question that's often posed to people of color. Um, and like you, Alia, and you, George, you develop, you know, or like many artists and, you know, I feel like I'm with friends now, I feel comfortable and I belong within this kind of framework that we're in now. And that's, that's fine. But I think it is important actually, because I walk into certain institutions and as Raksha and Dan were explaining right at the beginning, um, you're made to feel that you don't belong even though you should. And you're really, really made to feel that you don't belong sometimes. Um, I go to so many private views um, and to be very, very crude again, because sometimes you can't tell visibly what people's kind of, you know, racial, ethnic makeup is, but to be really crude, usually even at main galleries, I can count on more or less the fingers of one hand, people who obviously look as though they would be, you know, people of colour. And I said that to once, it was a show of a very famous artist um, from South Asia, um, passed away. So it was kind of like, you know, but it was off, off the artist's work and in a really prestigious gallery. So I said to the very, you know, the people running this institution, I pointed out that for this particular show, there were quite a lot of South Asians only because it happened to be this particular show, whereas normally it isn't. And they don't even want to hear the question actually. So I, I think it's not, I, you can be philosophical and be happy in your own world, but 
there's real discrimination going on, which has an impact on young people growing up, on older people, their mental health, their their potential to create, to, to become things that other people are able to become. So I think it is important. Yeah, I, I agree with you, yeah. There's one more brilliant question, but I, I think, um, it's, it's going to take up, um, it, it's a huge question around challenging racism. Uh, I'd, I, I'd love to answer it and spend time answering it, but you know, we're, we're, it's somebody from somebody gold and, um, um, uh, um, and, and, and maybe we can save this question and pose it for our next uh, event, which will focus on looking at racism and racial <laughs> violence in uh, painting specifically. So Gold, if you, if you, you know, come to our next one, you can pose the, this question again and we can kick off and talk about all of the questions. So, so for, the, for, the, for our audience, the question is, as South Asian artists, when do you finally infiltrate um, a space and take up space unerringly? Um, how do you deal with covert racism and aggression or, or oppression, oppression that you uh, uh, may face? And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a huge, uh, huge question, but in, in terms of like, when do you, us, finally infiltrate space? I believe that will change when the gatekeepers change and they open the doors and they let the ladders down, let the ladder down and, and, and take note of all of these artists that are out there um, working, have been working a lifetime um, and, and start showing their work. You know, so it's like we, we've been trying to infiltrate the system for like 50 years or more, you know, but that is gonna be, that is gonna be slow to change until the people in employed in galleries and museums that have taken up these senior roles change. So when that happens, we will infiltrate the system. So that, that's my top and well. I say f the system. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Everybody. Have their own system. <laughs> this is it. People have their own systems before. Like, okay. Yeah, sorry, we're, sorry. We're, we're I, gonna, I, it's, we're gonna... it's, it's the punk rocker in me. Yeah, you know, this is it. People are like, okay, uh, we can't get into the system. They're not letting us in. They're shutting the door. Um, they're not interested. Blah blah blah. You know, that that is still very much the case today. In my in my experience, at least, um, and, and you know, and I've seen in the time where people have got, oh well, we'll set up our own movement, our own galleries, and that. But you, you're still faced with lots of racism. Oh, it's, you know? it's true. Yeah, and, and I, it's, it's I, really I really agree true. with everything that Jai has just said. I mean, yeah, no. But um, yeah, we, we should, uh, we, you know, we're, you know, there's so much to say and I knew that there would be and I knew that there'd be amazing, um, really, you know, meaty questions coming in for us to all get our teeth into. But, you know, we do have other events coming up so we can we can go into those uh uh, questions in in more detail um it, you know in in the coming um in the coming year so uh, uh thank you everybody thank you um everybody that's attended this evening thank you for all the questions and and thank you olivia for um oh, yes. all of this uh, amazing the technical support you've been absolutely uh, fantastic and you know thanks to jai george alia uh, for your presentations, you know, ab absolutely brilliant. Thanks, thanks everyone so much. Thank you, thank you, Raksha. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, ja George and Jai. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Raksha and Dan. Uh, looking forward to the next event as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.